I dropped the poem. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's worthy of all praise. Isn't he awesome? Yes. That was a great review. That was almost like a, a whole new session. Wasn't that rich? Yes. You know, I don't know. I need to listen to what I say. <laughs> oh, wow. You know what I think would be a wonderful idea? I think if each of you are discovering lessons and you're making note, would you send them to me? I think these are good enough lessons. Let's, let's go for 70. And among all of us, we'll come up with 70 and I'll print them. I might modify them just slightly to make them really good in print. But that would be a contribution that we could make from this conference and share with others. Because these truths stand alone. I can put scripture with every one of them, can't you? So do that. Just these nuggets as you're... you're Corey was reading me last night, or was it this morning? This morning. How many did you come up with? Sixteen lessons. When I, you know, he's a numbers man. He's an accountant um, among many things. And uh, when, when I said that there will probably be seventy, keep track. Listen. He took that as a numbers challenge. I know him. <laughs> He's going to listen for 70. <laughs> Let's listen with expectation. Because the Lord's talking to us. Two or three of you have come to me to say you came last night with specific questions that were answered. You see, God knows what we need. It's a personal thing. And you know as well as I that in an atmosphere where we're not troubled by distractions. The only one being distracted that, that's allowed is Pastor Shy, And she's on transportation duty this morning. So she's trying to organize to collect people that are coming in today. The rest of us are not distracted. We've, we've set aside our regular duties because the Lord's called us to this event and we're allowing him to be first. And so that's a, that's, a, that's a commitment that we make. It's a choice. It's a choice we make. And therefore we really glean because our ears are open and the Lord is always speaking. He's speaking in your conversations one with another. He's speaking through the worship. He's speaking through the teaching. He's speaking through things that happen in your housing, uh, in, your, in your housing settings, around lunch, all, everything. Expect to hear. Expect to hear. You know, sometimes preachers, they want to just do all the talking. You know, let's be careful that when we get together, we're not just promoting ourselves, but we're listening. We're listening. It's okay to talk about our ministries. I'm not saying that's bad. That's good. But do it in a way that encourages someone else. That's it. We're here to serve one another. Before you sit down, I want to pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be in this place and in your wonderful presence. Thank you that your plan for today is beyond explanation. It's even beyond what we can imagine or even think because you are greater than where we are now, greater than our ideas of yesterday. You're greater than our needs. You're greater than our questions. And I thank you that it is your wonderful goodwill to impart to your people those things that will transform them so that when they return to their areas of serving you among people, they will have greater confidence, a greater clarity of message, a greater reflection of you, and greater fruit for their labors. I thank you in Jesus' name that your plan is always good and we submit to it with all that we are, with faith, expectation, with great joy. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we talk to you this morning. Everyone say, Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated.
Our theme for this conference, as you know, is 70 Years of Leadership Lessons. And it's really, it's, it's really difficult for me to, could I say, codify, for me to enumerate the lessons. When, when I sit back to just think about what we learn in a lifetime of serving the Lord. It's really too much to even try to pass on. We live it, I think maybe that's why Jesus said that our examples were so important. Words fail us. But all of our lives, our examples, our behavior, our conversation, our responses, our, our reactions, our, our choices, all of these things reflect what we have learned in that relationship with Jesus Christ. So the things I'm sharing, I'm, I'm serious about what I said last night. Listen for the lessons. We have, I have a topic for each of our sessions. Last night was leadership is spiritual. But there, was, there were so many lessons embedded in that topic as, as you've testified to this morning and I believe that you've come a long way you have sacrificed it has not been easy for some of you to come but the Lord wants to so overwhelm you with blessing with encouragement with power with balance with strength with effectiveness with faith with faith I've never boasted of having any particular gift. I was ministering with a minister. If I told you the name, you would know him. Very well known. And he was curious about my gift. What is your, what is your principal gift? And I didn't know. I, I said, well, I don't know. I, I just do what I'm to do. And Jesus does the work. And he's, he's the gift. He has it all. So I don't try to keep track. And I certainly don't own any gift. So, uh, as I was saying that, I could tell it wasn't, it wasn't answering his question at all. Okay, I ministered all through two days with him. And, and when we were all finished, we were having a meal together. And he says, I know what your gift is. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Some people just have to fit it in their box. Nevertheless, he said, your gift is a gift of faith. And I said, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad to know that. But I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, how can anyone be saved without faith? And God gives to everyone a measure of faith. So why should I think I need more faith than the measure that God has given that is sufficient to receive all that he has and walk in his life? Isn't that wonderful? So if I have it, you have it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I will say, it is not difficult for me to trust God. But for no believer should it be difficult because everything we know about our salvation is in this book. Therefore, we believe about our salvation because we've read it in this book. And therefore, our lives are lives of faith continually in those things that are written and revealed through the Holy Spirit, in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. But I'm, what I'm saying to you is, in this atmosphere, something is happening to you. And when you go home, you're going to be amazed that some of the struggles you have had just won't be there anymore, only because your faith has been strengthened. Your faith. So we don't have to wonder when we have faith. We don't have to know everything. When we have faith. Things happen we can't explain. We face questions from people that we don't know the answer to. Well, we don't have to pretend. We can say, I don't know, but God does. Have faith in him. He knows everything. He's involved. He cares. We're not God. We're his carrier. Amen. Well, today I want to talk to you about another aspect of leadership. I think this is one of the most misunderstood priorities in Christian leadership of all that we might name 
And I'm calling this particular session topic leadership through leadership is influence through service. Leadership is influence through service. The Christ style of leadership is never a style of coercion or force or manipulation. And I'm sorry that so many Christian leaders, they don't know another model. I was thinking about uh, the former Soviet Union and the nations that were under communism during that time. My father and I were in that part of the world shortly uh, after my mother's passing. We were there in 95 and 96 for weeks visiting the 10 major cities of the former Soviet Union. And it was there that I met Bishop Natasha. She was my interpreter and, and we, we became forever friends in the gospel. She's a great, a great woman leader doing a wonderful work across that vast area. And what we were witnessing were a lot of large churches that had just sprung up, large congregations, I could say. They didn't really have churches yet. So these congregations had exploded and they were being led by young converts. They, some had only been saved two, three, five years, and yet they're leading thousands of people. And the only model for leadership, a leadership style that they had witnessed was the communist style. And it was one of force. It was one of, of manipulation, one of cruelty, one that bred division and mistrust. And so it, it took time. And I'm sure the Lord is still working on his church in, in that part of the world. He's not done with them. He's still working, so we're patient. He is. He's teaching them gradually as they're able to embrace change. That Jesus' style was not that. Now, let me tell you, if anyone had the right to demand obedience, to dictate response, it was Jesus. And yet he didn't. He would even say things like, if you follow me, whoever calls on me, whoever comes to me, he's not chasing people down. He's not shackling them. No. So you see, the style of Jesus is so opposite the style in the world. And need I remind you that the style in the world is often modeled after the secular systems of the world. And all of these systems, these styles, even cultural dynamics, all developed within the context of sin. Hello? It was not so in the garden. All of human development, societal development, cultural development, the systems of the world were developed under the rule of Satan. I'm not saying they're all demonic, understand. You have to have methods of order when people are, are rebellious and living under the rule of sin and death. Of course we understand that guidelines are needed. We understand, but when then you come into the kingdom of God, you come within the body of Christ and everything is to be a reflection of him and modeled after him and his spirit is to be the infused energy and presence out of which everything flows that concerns our example as believers. We have to step back and say, wait a minute. Everything I've ever watched or admired in secular leaders or the systems that have modeled after secular systems, I need to review. Let's just review. And to go back to school in leadership style, we have to go to the feet of Jesus. And it is, it's there where I want to take you this morning. And so we turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Very familiar passage. You will, you will enjoy it. I'm reading from the New King James. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, 
that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? <laughs> Jesus said, what I'm doing, you don't understand now, but you will know after this. Oh, I love that. We don't have to know everything now. We're going to understand later. Can we trust for the later? Mm -hmm. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. <laughs> we speak sometimes too quickly. L listen more. Speak less. Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And then, of course, Simon said, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. <laughs> And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed, he or she who is bathed, needs only to wash their feet and is completely clean and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him and therefore he said, you're not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should follow, do as I have done to you. I think this is so powerful. I could teach all day just from these these profound verses. But we're talking about the ministry of service, leadership as service in order to influence the lives of people. We, most of us would understand the culture of Jesus' day and why washing feet was so important. People were walking in sandals, in the dust, such as many nations of the earth. You come into a house and your feet are dirty because you've been walking in the dust. And so in Jesus' day, the lowest ranking servant would be the one to rush with the pails of water and the towel and extend this act of hospitality to the guests of the master of the house. A very, a very common thing, a very necessary thing, but it was a low level task. I, 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 I'm never, I, I never ignore those who come running to me with the bail, pails of water, because I know their status and I know they're like zeros. No one cares about them usually, not worried about, did they sleep last night? Did anybody, have they had time to eat? Uh, is, who's looking after their children? In many cases, they just are there, they're lucky to have a place to work and get a little bit, or at least food. You understand? But I take note of those, because if Jesus extended that kind of service, then it's one, it falls into that category of being great in the kingdom. Let's consider those great in the kingdom that Christ considers great in the kingdom. That would be a very good idea. There are two, but let me finish that thought. So when we see Jesus stooping down, he gathered his own water, got his own towel. Do you understand? And he stooped down. Oh, my friends, if that's not the picture of the divine creator, savior of the world, 
He always was stooping down because we were so low. And he came low, not to just be low with us, but to lift us up. And in his stooping, he cleansed us. He washed us. He made us right. The contamination was removed because he was willing to stoop down and then we could stand up clean. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So this act of service, is, is a, it's a key that's so central to our leadership. I know of some groups that take this very literal, it's okay, and they have created a, a, a ritual of foot washing. That's no problem to me. That's not what I'm talking about today. It's not the washing of feet any more than the washing of Peter with water was going to cleanse him. Amen. We're talking about a spiritual dynamic. Yes. So we're, we're seeing that what Jesus was doing was symbolic and an example. Yes. What does that mean to us? That means to follow the model of Jesus in leadership, yes. we are the ones who see where there's dust. Yes. We're the ones who take note of those that need washing. We're the ones, we're not offended by people's dirt. We're the ones empowered to stoop down and cleanse so they likewise can rise up. And it's an act of service. Ministry is service. Leadership is service. If we're not willing to serve, we need to get a job. <laughs> Ministry is not a job. It's not a career choice. It's a life of serving humanity in every way that God allows us to be useful. Oh my. There are two pillars that I think are so important in effective leadership. And they're the two that I'm drawing attention to in this session. It's it's service and influence. You see, when we, when we influence people, what we're doing, we are, we are shifting. We're, uh, our influence results in their change. You understand? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? We all have influence. And we're either influencing people right or wrong. We can, we can make one statement and start a verbal bonfire on political issues. On hurricane relief behavior by the government. We can just start an argument, get people's blood pressure up, get them hot. Racial issues, economic issues. It's so easy to stir up a fight. It takes something greater to be a peacemaker, to know how to use our influence for the good of people. I read a post by a friend of mine last night, and it was very simply, standing against injustice is the Bible way. You understand? So I'm not saying we're such mealy mouth, no, that won't translate, uh, that we are, so, we are so careful to not offend and to keep peace that we don't speak the truth. No, we speak the truth in love. We're aware that it's not just our feelings we're projecting. We are the carriers of the divine life. And we are influencing people to think with God. God fights injustice. Someone, um, you know, I stay out of these things on Facebook, but uh, one of the people who responded said, where in the Bible is that? And fortunately, the one who put the post said, uh, from Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> but you see, God came into a world where everything was wrong. He was the solution. He was rejected. 
and yet he was weaving his influence, speaking words, confounding the wise. He was surprising people. He was acting in ways that didn't fit. That was him. So I'm saying there is a way. But we have to ask the Lord for the way. And we have to pause and let him lead. Otherwise, it's all our opinion. No, we want God's opinion because he probably sees through the problem even better than we do. He knows the spirit behind the injustice. Service and influence. I wish every leader understood the value of serving. And I wish every, every leader, and you know that's every spirit-filled believer, I wish they understood the priority of influence. That's really all we have. Isn't it true? We don't have a whip, we don't have a gun. We don't have a rank that we can just put people in prison if they don't do right. We can just lock them up. No, we don't have any of that. What we have is influence. And I believe influence that's motivated by the Spirit of God will win every time. Amen. I believe in godly influence. I think we come in the scene and we, we change everything. We're like, we're like the... the uh, we show up and the, the temperature changes. The mood changes. The conversation is elevated. Do you understand? I believe in influence. That's what Jesus had. That's what he used. And he served. Do you know that when we, when we use the style of coercion, when we think because we're important or we have a title or we're in charge or we're the, we're the big shot, th that won't translate either. Um, if, we're, if we're the one with the highest ranking, that we can force people to do what's right. But listen, the results are not the results God wants. We might be able to force people to behave a certain way on the outside. But Jesus came and turned the, the value system right side up. And the law looked on the outward always. Everything before Christ was outside behavior. You've got to say it a certain way, dress a certain way, talk a certain way, worship a certain way. That, everything was outside. Jesus said, nope, that doesn't even count. What's on the inside is what counts. So he internalized truth and taught us that when we're changed on the inside it will make its way to the outside uh -huh. so the inside change happens first the outside follows and it's what's on the inside the motive of the heart why do we do what we do that's what God looks at he doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. So when we can influence people in such a way that they, for example, give from the heart, they'll be blessed. If we just manage to coerce them into giving, we're cheating them out of the blessing. Because God can't bless a heart that is, is, is just <sighs> resisting giving doesn't want to give. No. God judges the heart. He loves a cheerful giver. One who gives what they want to give freely. Wow, that's not like the law, is it? No. That's, Pastor Shai mentioned last night, you can see it in everything we do in our local church and in other areas. We, we really believe that God wants to bless people. And we want people to understand that partnership with God in financial areas is the key. See him as the source, give out of joy, trusting him to be the provider. So we influence people to give for the right reasons. We don't check up on people to see if they're giving their tithe. We don't come and, and have a special meeting to lecture those who are not giving their tithes. That's between them and God. We make it clear what we see in the scripture. But then people have to want to obey the Lord. 
We want people to do it for the right reasons. Are you hearing me? So we want our influence to cause people's hearts to be right. Uh, not, not to do a certain thing for recognition, for credit, for, for remuneration, for, uh, for favor, for a special seat, for a special attention, a special anything. No, no. Serve the Lord out of your heart. And you'll be blessed. You will be noticed. You'll be recognized. All that's just an after effect. It's not the motivation. Mm. We don't want people to... Let me say, the enemy has trained people to do things out of fear. Fear is the number one weapon of the enemy. And so... Fear, because we've all been born in this world of sin, fear is n perceived as normal. It's not only normal, it's actually a sign of intelligence if you're afraid. You should be afraid of germs, afraid of the person with a gun, afraid of the employer, afraid of losing someone you love. And in some cases, afraid of certain diseases. You know, grandma had it, mama had it, I'm going to get it. That kind of fear. <laughs> and it, so people, people will think, they'll never, they'll never challenge you on those kind of fears. Because that's normal. Everyone who in their right mind is afraid of these things. And if you're not afraid, then um, you're in denial. <laughs> or you're just not well informed. And so now bring that into the church and too many times leaders lead people through fear. F if they don't do a certain thing, God's going to punish them. Oh, so they teach fear of God. Fear of curses. Fear of this or fear of that. That's not, oh, people will respond, but it's not the right response. We want to influence in a way that gets the right response. Can I just tell you that I like to speak about fear because I used to be one of the most fearful people that I've ever known. I was a fearful child. I was afraid of people. I was afraid of spiders. I was afraid of lizards. I was afraid of being alone. I was afraid of everything. I just was a timid, uh, fearful child. But then I got saved. And then I was filled with the Holy Ghost, as you know. And then I began to realize, but wait a minute, I have to, I have to be willing to challenge my fears. Now, it didn't happen overnight. But over a period of time walking with the Lord, I have had to confront my fears. Now, I came to the place where I recognized that fear wasn't right. No kind of fear is right. We fear nothing. We don't even fear death because one blink and we're with Jesus. Amen. So what do we have to fear? Amen. Poverty, he's our provider. Amen. Sickness, he's our healer. Amen. Whatever, loss, he's our sustainer. Amen. So, so we really have no reason to fear. We don't fear what people say about us. Amen. God is our defender. Yes. We, don't, we don't fear. We cannot allow fear because if the enemy can find fear in us. You see, fear and faith cannot cohabitate. So he'll start with something very small and very reasonable, like the flu. If you all don't know what the flu is, don't bother. Americans know. It's something that comes seasonally and everybody fears it. <laughs> Good. When I discovered that fear was wrong, they, see, if the enemy can create access, all he does then is piggyback on that one fear after another. And before you know it, you're afraid of everything. When I'm getting ready to go to certain places, uh, I have some people say, oh, I mean for ministry, for evangelism, they'll say, oh, is it safe? <laughs> and I don't know how to answer because I never knew that taking the gospel to the ends of the world, or serving Christ for that matter, was a call to safety. 
I th- <laughs> Listen, if I were afraid to go, I wouldn't go. But where God sends me, I know he can keep me. When I was a child, uh, my mother was our first teacher. And she really taught us how to study, have a love of learning. I appreciate that about her. But she, she kept us with reading material. Now, I don't know about my brother. I can't speak for him. But, it, uh, but I had all kinds of, were like, they were missionary books. From, from, the, from the 17th, 18th, 1900s, these first missionaries that would go into these places. And I loved these books. That was my library growing up. Well, all these missionaries died. That's why they were remembered. Because they gave their lives. They lost their spouses. They buried their children. They were tortured. They were arrested. They were, they, it, was, it was never an easy life. So I assumed as a child that every Christian... See, I didn't know the difference in a regular Christian and a missionary Christian. I thought every Christian was a missionary. (laughs) And so I assumed that every Christian, sooner or later, is going to be martyred for their faith. That was just, that's all the disciples were, except for John. So... Paul was. There was nothing in the scripture that you're going to be safe from all the things that might happen in this world. But we have a purpose. And we preach the gospel. And we're not afraid. And we put Christ first. And we're not afraid because what what can happen to us here? That doesn't end in reward. Do you understand? So it's funny because I was scared of spiders, but I was ready to give my life for Jesus. (laughs) But when I recognized that fear was a tool of the enemy, that was a big discovery for me. And from that moment, I began running toward everything that I had feared. And I stand before you today with a testimony. Just what the scripture says, when you resist the devil, he flees. He takes his fear with him. I'm not afraid of anything. I tr- sometimes I hear myself say that and I think, mm, surely that's not true. I need to think there's, cause so I can give a little disclaimer. But I can't think of anything. And that's not boastful. That's a testimony. The enemy has to flee and he's the one that has the bag of fear. He can run and take all of his baggage with him. Because we are a people of faith. We are people called for a purpose in the earth. This is not our home. We're on a journey, and our journey is one that testifies to the person, the work, the ultimate resurrection and authority of Jesus Christ. And we influence through our service. And the reason that gives that such great influence is it's so rare in this world. Everyone wants to be served. And when you choose to serve, it stands out. People are like, ooh, what's that about you? Hmm. They'll remember you. They'll come and want to serve you because you have chosen to serve. Do things God's way. It works. And it always has reward. We don't do it for the reward. We do it because that's what Jesus says to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've learned to serve in many ways before I really understood the spiritual and biblical principles. I was, I told you that I was a child that my heart was toward the Lord. It was easy for me to love the Lord. I I, I thank God for that. I can't explain it. Every child isn't that way. I thank God that I was. And so as I grew up in positions in the ministry... You know from last night that I became the international general manager at the age of 28. I was young. Before that, probably six years before that, I was in a certain capacity. I think at the time I was a purchaser. I was doing the purchasing of all of our tools for evangelism and negotiating many, many things. 
And we had the governing body of, of the organization was a board of directors, and then the officers, the president, the, uh, the, my father was the president, my mother was the vice president, and then we had treasurer and secretary. And so the governance of the day-to-day -day business of the ministry was done by the officers that we called the executive council. Any three of those could function and carry out the day-to-day -day business. Well, when my mother and father were out of the country, that left two, so there could not be a third. I remember the day that my mother called me into her office and she says, your father and I are going to someplace and we're going to be gone longer than usual. And as you know, the executive council makes decisions in our absence. They're empowered to do that. So they meet every day to make decisions. I want you to sit in on their meetings and be sure that the decisions that are made are what we would want. No title, no authority. All they were told was, we've asked LaDonna to sit in on the meetings. They didn't even say, listen to what she says, or she knows what we want. Not one word. So here at first executive meeting, and here I show up, they knew I was coming. I want you to know for that entire period of their absence, I sat in on every meeting, and it was during that time that I learned influence through service and diplomacy, as a matter of fact. Because when you have no rank, no title, no authority, and yet you have a way that must be followed. Now, is that any different than a Christian in this world? We don't always have the rank. We don't have the authority in the world. We don't have the title. We don't have the money. We don't have the weapon. We don't have the force. We don't have, uh, the, we don't have the things that the world is used to. And yet we, it's like the Lord says, I want you to sit in on everything that happens in the world. And I want you to be sure that my will is done. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Oh, and by the way, I'm giving you a helper. And he'll tell you what needs to be done. And if you'll trust him, a good outcome will always be achieved. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, you can influence when by the world standards, you have no voice. Believe it. Believe it. There are some elements of service that before we close, I just want to give to you. I think an important part of service is self-discipline. Self-discipline. The leader must be able to govern his or her own life. Self-discipline. I understand that the only true discipline is self-discipline. And it's because you can be forced on the outside. But if you choose from the inside, that's self-discipline. And there's no power against that. That's real discipline. Leadership starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with us as leaders. What is the level of our integrity when no one's looking, when no one would know? That's self-discipline, that we do what is right when it's just us and God. Consistency. Consistency. That's a trait that every Christian leader needs. Do you know that people are afraid? I've talked about that, but people generally are afraid. They're, not, they're uncomfortable. They're not quite sure what's, they're, 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 that's why they, they cling to status quo and they're, they feel safe in a place that they know where everything, even a woman in an abusive marriage, she will stay in that marriage just because she already knows when to duck. You understand? And to get 
out of that and be free, she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know when she's safe, when she's not safe. She hasn't learned what are the rules in this new freedom, free world. And they'll rush back into the abuse because they know when to duck. And when people that you lead begin to recognize consistency in you, they will start feeling safe. People deserve that. They're coming out of all kinds of circumstances, pain, disappointment, abuse, the marks of life under that evil ruler are all over them. And they dare to come into an atmosphere of faith. And it takes them a while to trust leaders because they've been wounded before. They've been disappointed before. They've been used before. So consistency. When people can see you in the pulpit or in whatever your role that the people would see you in leadership and then in your home, in a relaxed moment, at play, with your family. And when there's consistency, it breeds confidence. And that becomes a great influence. So this is all part of, of the self-discipline that we function in. What about fairness? Where is there fairness in this world? There is no fairness in the world. No, there's no such thing as fairness in the world. It's, Excuse me, translators, do the best you can. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world under the rule of Satan. That means I'll do whatever I have to to get you before you get me. I'll use you so I can advance. I'll steal from you so that I can have. I'll slander you so that I can look good. That's dog-eat-dog. -dog. That's sin-motivated. That's the style of the enemy. So fairness should be one of the things that people find in the church. And yet Paul had to give special instructions, say, hey, tr don't treat people with partiality. Don't just bring the special people on the front row. Don't just, ju don't just cater to those that are rich, those that you think you can get something from. You know, in churches today, if you've got one big family in the church, you dare not offend one of them or they'll all leave. And the pastor thinks, uh-oh, the offering will really go down. Well, let it go down. Be, be truthful. Be fair. Be fair. You've got a rich business person. I'm in some countries that the whole church system depends on the business people. And those business people are like uh, puppeteers. And they, they just boss everything from behind. I have left more than one field after me telling the pastors, no, everyone participates in the money, in the sharing of the blessing. We will not let one person provide for everything. Did you know if I had, if I had $100 million to do everything in the work of the kingdom that is in my heart to do, I still would go to individual believers and say, this is what God wants done. And you get the privilege of being part of his program. Are you understanding me? There's fairness. We don't just take the easy way. We take the way where God, God can bless people. I love him. He wants to bless people. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Fairness. One of the hard lessons I learned about fairness was working in what you could say my parents' ministry. I think that would be the way to convey it. Here where you're the daughter, people expect that you're going to be shown favoritism. Uh, not in our family. Not in our family. I always received less pay less consideration when there was disagreement. And my, my parents were very strong against this thing we call nepotism. Now nepotism has snuck so deeply into the church now, people actually think that's God's way. That is supposed to be the family members. Now I'm the family, 
I'm standing right here telling you I'm the family. I'm leading this great ministry. But it was a surprise to my parents, a surprise to me. It was God's choice, and we just flowed with it. Do you understand? It was never suggested to be by my parents that I would ever go into the public pulpit ministry, that I would ever be an evangelist or ever. It was never, it was never even, my father's philosophy was, well, and I heard him tell many young preachers this. He would say, well, uh, Jesus told me what to do and I obeyed. He'll tell you what to do, obey. So that's the way they raised my brother and me. You just do whatever the Lord tells you to do. And that's when I told my parents what the Lord had said to me about ministry. They said, well, if that's what the Lord says, do it. It's so simple. I'm talking about fairness. I love the Lord. He breaks all the rules. Even in the Old Testament, when everything was so patriarchal, so first son oriented, Jesus, I mean, God just, just would step on the scene and surprise people. Choose the youngest. Choose the one that didn't look good. You know, I love that. And in Jesus, it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. I said, it's all about the heart. Mm. Self-discipline is that one uh, element of service. The second is self-growth. Self-growth, that means intentional growth. We do grow. We do, we can't help but process in one way or another. We're either making positive growth or negative growth, but we're always changing. But self-improvement has to be something we take responsibility for. Whether it's learning, we choose to continue learning. Growing spiritually, that's our responsibility with Christ. Growing in knowledge. I told you last night when I was 40 years old, I went to college for the first time. And for 11 years, I sat in classrooms like any 19-year-old <laughs> and studied and learned until I earned finally a doctoral degree after 11 years of full, full schedules every semester, including summer. It was my choice. God put it in my heart. But I'm a continual student. Amen. You don't, a degree doesn't mean you stop learning. Amen. No, you, you can never stop learning. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Self-growth includes skills. Over my lifetime and because of the ministry that I was part of, and I really think looking back because the Lord was working through my mother primarily. She was the chief administrator, the one who, who really made everything happen. My father was a visionary and she's the one who would take the ideas and hook them to the ground and cause them to be multiplied all over the world. She was a gifted leader and administrator. And because our organization required so many skills, I was just sent from one to the next to the next, much to my chagrin. You understand? As soon as I got good at something, I was moved. So I never had the privilege of being good at anything. But I was able to do everything. <laughs> I'm glad looking back. But just when you, when you look at that resume, an abbreviated resume in that letter, you'll, you'll be amazed. But things like technology, I still run after technology because it's changing so fast that's the place I have to prioritize otherwise I'm be, I become redundant in one year you understand business bu you have to have business principles to run a ministry writing you have to be able to write I've learned to write photography I was one of the first most of the books of my parents I was the photographer at the time I was 12 years old, I was climbing ladders and taking pictures and, and it was a job to be done. Promotion, how do you write to promote people? How do you promote in a way to elicit a good response? That's, that's a skill. You can learn these things. Fundraising. My father used to say, if you don't have money, you don't have a ministry. That was a pretty hard thing for him to say to young preachers coming to him, asking him for a handout. He says, we live by faith. I suggest you do the same. 
Peč, peč. <laughs> but you see, you have to learn to motivate people. Influence. You hear what I'm talking about? Accounting. What are you going to do with money? You have to handle it properly. In our culture, you have to handle it in a way that satisfies the demands of our government. You have to do it right. What about people skills? I'm amazed how many people who are in leadership aren't good with people. They don't know how to diffuse uh, crises. They don't know how to, how to guide a person in understanding what's going on in them, how to guide them in relationships so they can reconcile people. They just don't have a clue. All they know is, uh, I don't mean to, no, I shouldn't say that. It's a skill that must be learned. It can be learned. And you add the Holy Spirit to it, and then you, you're more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. There are also uh, gifts of the Spirit that are to be developed. Every gift has to be exercised. You understand? We can't just sit back and expect the Holy Spirit to do everything fine. We participate with the Holy Spirit. We cooperate. We trust Him. We exercise the gifts. Our own relationship with God. I'm talking about self. Self. Self-growth. Growth in all of these areas. Growth in walking in the Spirit. And then there's self-motivation. Leaders must motivate themselves. Other people are not going to motivate us. We have to motivate ourselves. We're leaders. We're out front. Romans 12. I like this. Verses 6 through 8. It's a familiar passage, but hear it in the context of this self-motivation. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, teach. If it's to encourage, give encouragement. If it's giving, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. What's the point? The Holy Spirit can give the gifts. Christ can give the gifts. But we've got to do it. Some of you have gifts you've never done. Time to do them. You've got them. You've got them. Leaders must set goals for themselves. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. In a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way to get the prize. So we set goals. What are the goals for your ministry or your life, your personal life, your family life, your spiritual life, your academic life, your social life? What are the goals what are your goals? Have you, what are your goals for the next 12 months? Do you know what you want to achieve? Have you set some difficult goals so that God can show up? That's every year I go to time of prayer to just to, to forecast with God. What are our goals for the next year? He has an opinion because he has already been there, you know. Our next year is not a surprise to him. He already knows and he'll guide. He'll guide. Let me just close with this scripture and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a break. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. I'm reading from the NIV. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name, the name, the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue, 
Acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. We have the supreme model for influencing eternity through our service. Heavenly Father, thank you for these nuggets of truth, these lessons from your word, from your example, from our lives. Thank you that by your Holy Spirit we can apply them with excellence in order to accomplish your ultimate purpose in the lives of people. Start with us, but may it not end with us. In the name of Jesus, amen, 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 amen. God bless you. I think what we'll do is take about a, uh, it is a few minutes, four minutes after 11. Let's resume at 11.30. I'd like to get in one more session before we break for lunch, and then the afternoon is going to be exciting. So there's bookstore to look at. Go into this other area where the tables are laid with ministry information, products.